Welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate. It's so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those setbacks and challenges you faced or are facing today, don't define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And no one I know, and I know a lot of people, (laughs) no one I know knows that better, I don't believe, than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of this program, and my friend Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, we've got a, uh, we've got a, a really, really strong episode today, I believe. So I'm looking forward to getting going. Absolutely. Very much looking forward to it. And our guest today is, okay, now I've lost it again. Sorry. Got it. All right. We're going to start it again. Here we go. And our guest today is Lion Goodman. Lion is the author of five books, including Clear Your Client's Limiting Beliefs, Creating on Purpose, Transforming Trauma, and Clear Your Beliefs. He has taught workshops and trainings across the U.S., Canada, Europe, Central America, and China, working with organizations such as the Shift Network, Mind Valley, Deaf in Space, Luminary Leadership Institute, and Lifebook. His articles have been widely published in books, magazines, and blog sites, including Choice Magazine for Coaches, Coaching Perspectives, Good Men, uh, The Good Men Project, and Your Tango. He has been featured on more than 100 summits, radio programs, podcasts, and television shows. In his past life, Lyon spent 25 years as an executive search consultant and executive coach, finding talent for hundreds of companies and executives across the U.S., from Fortune 500 corporations to venture-funded startup companies. Warwick, that's a lot of experience, and that just scratches the surface of what makes Lion such a good guest today. So take it away. So Lion, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, Very much looking forward to our discussion. And, you know, I love what you do and uh, just some of the themes in your book, Clear Your Limiting Beliefs. And uh, as you talk about finding your true self and sort of throwing away some of those belief systems that don't uh, serve us, and we'll obviously get into that discussion, which I'm looking forward to. But I kind of want to start um, kind of at the backstory. Uh, I know there's a amazing crucible moment that we'll get into that was... Uh, life-defining, could have been life-ending. Uh, it was certainly <laughs> life-altering. Uh, but uh, just talk a bit about kind of who was a young Lion Goodman, what were some of the things you liked to do, were there any kind of seeds of who you were to become in maybe, you know, the young Lion growing up? Thank you, Warwick, and, and thank you, Gary. It's great to be with you. I'm really pleased to be here on your program. Uh, when I when I'm asked this question, I think back to my childhood, and I remember being very lonely. Uh, even though I grew up with three brothers and sisters uh, and two parents in the house um, and kind of lower middle class neighborhood, um, I felt lonely. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. I didn't feel like I belonged to the family, certainly. Everything seemed a little bit off. And I noticed that other people seemed normal. And so I wanted to be normal like them. I wanted to like be easygoing and friendly and have friends and do things that other people were doing, but I couldn't ever find my fit. I couldn't, I didn't fit in somehow. Uh, And so it made me an observer of other people. Uh, And so I was watching other kids to see, you know, how, how do they be who they are? (laughs) Uh, It made me curious to know uh, how they were able to just be be themselves when I was kind of struggling inside. Uh, but that observer status actually served me well because I was, I got interested in how people are, what they do, how they, why they do what they do. So I was kind of an early uh, seeker or philosopher. Uh, I was studied science and the body and I, I was very interested in the brain and the mind. And somehow I think at about age 13, I decided I was going to be a psychiatrist uh, because I was, my mother wanted me to be a doctor, 
and I was interested in the mind, so psychiatrists were mind doctors. So that's that's kind of set set myself up. So I was I was really interested in human nature. What is the nature of human nature? Why do we do the things we do? What's what what is motivation? And by the time I got to college, I was very fortunate in meeting some great teachers who were asking those same questions. And and so I got very involved in the study of, of physics and chemistry and physiology and neuro anatomy, neurology, uh, philosophy, religion. I was just kind of absorbing everything I could trying to understand those big questions of life. And I graduated with a degree in consciousness studies because that was the focus of my interest. What is consciousness? Where does it come from? How does it function? What is the mind? Uh, and I was I created my own degree program, so it was the first degree granted in that field, as far as I know. So that's a fascinating journey. Uh, as you look back, I mean, why were you so interested in in how human beings are wired and why they are who they are? And I mean, you just have this passion to understand who are who who are we as human beings and what makes us tick? And uh, did you have any like history of psychologists, psychiatrists, or in your family, I mean, what made you go down that road? Because at a young age, you just had this passion to understand what makes human beings tick. Well, I knew that there was something wrong with me. And I wanted to fix it. So I figured if I could figure out why people are the way they are, I could fix myself. That was kind of my driving motivation. <clears throat> uh, fortunately, after you know 40 years of inner work, I, I, I found I... I was not normal and would never be normal, and there was no such thing as normal. So that was a relief to find that out. But I was always trying to become normal, and I got more and more abnormal or unnormal, I guess. Uh, so, but it was an interest in myself. I was trying to, I was trying to place myself somewhere, and by studying everything I could about human nature, I figured I might find my place that I belong. Let's sort of fast forward a bit to understand that um, uh, you became a salesperson. So help me understand, and that led to the crucible. So you have this fascination with psychology, but you went into, into being a sales, salesman. How did that kind of happen uh, out of curiosity? By mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... As I said, I graduated with a degree in consciousness studies, which I created myself at the University of Colorado. Uh, but nobody was hiring people with degrees with people with degrees in consciousness studies because I had created it. <laughs> so, right. so I was on the bleeding edge, as they say. Uh, and so I couldn't find a job. And so I just took a job that was available, which was being a traveling salesman. Uh, and I traveled for about a year and a half trying to figure out what do I really want to do? You Because know, I thought about going back to school and going to medical school, which was an original idea, except for chemistry. That didn't didn't suit me very well. Um, I, I thought about getting a Ph.D. Um, like some of my friends had done, but nothing seemed to fit because I was not normal. So uh, I was on the road for about a year and a half, kind of taking a vacation, selling stuff to stores around the southwest. Uh, and that's what led to the crucible moment is kind of being confused, not being clear about what I was doing or why, uh, and uh, and looking for what was next. Talk a bit about that crucible and, you know, where were you going? What were you doing? And and what happened? Because it's a fascinating story. Well, first, of all, I was in the middle of this uh kind of strange state of like being OK, traveling, making a little bit of money seeing the sights, uh, taking my time, going from town to town and traveling around. Um, but it was a kind of lonely life. And, uh, and um, I wanted something to happen next. I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, so I was on my way from Las Vegas to LA uh, with my van. I had an RV uh, van that, that I drove around. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing about me is that I was a good Samaritan. So when I saw someone whose car had broken down or a flat tire, I'd stop and help them. That was just my ethic of being on the road. So I was driving through the Mojave Desert between Las Vegas and LA, and there was a guy whose car had broken down and he was staring into the hood, under the hood, as if he knew what he was doing, but it was clear he was lost. Um, and I stopped and I said, you know, can I help you in any way? He said, oh, I just 
put two hundred dollars into her, and now she won't start, and I don't I don't know what to do. Uh, and I said, Well, I'm heading into L.A. Do you want to ride? And he looked at me kind of funny, and he went, Yeah, okay. And he he grabbed his duffel bags and a couple boxes, and he brought them into my van, and we started driving further toward L.A. And at first I thought this is, was a mistake. I'm going to drop him off somewhere, you know, but then I kind of took him under my wing and we smoked a little pot, which made things easier. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and pretty soon we were talking and, and, uh, I, I stopped for food and I said, do you want some food? He said, I don't have any money. I said, well, I'll buy you a meal. You know, so I kind of took him under my wing and, uh, we ended up traveling together for three days and I'd stop at a store and, show my wares and he'd I sent him on errands eventually for getting the van gassed up or washed. Uh and we were kind of a, you know, it was nice to have company uh after traveling alone for so long. Uh and then at night he'd camp out outside the van. I'd sleep inside the van. And so we were east of LA uh near Claremont and the, this was the third night out and I was in the back of the van crouched between cabinets moving things around because the van was filled with stuff, my stuff, his stuff. Um, and uh, he was in the front of the van listening to music. And suddenly there was an explosion and something hit me in the head. And my first thought was the gas stove had exploded. And I looked up and the gas stove was intact up to my left. And then I looked further to my left and there he was in the front of the van with a gun pointed at me from the front seat. And I realized I had been shot. And that was a surprise. Came out of nowhere. And so uh, at first I thought he was warning me, um, like he was going to take my stuff. And at that point, it was like easy to say it's all yours. In fact, I think I said that either under my breath or out loud, it's all yours. Leave me outside the van naked, take it all. None of it was important to me. You know, it was just my stuff. Um, but then he shot again. And that bullet missed me by a fraction of an inch, but I knew at that moment that he wasn't just warning me that he was going to kill me. So what do you do when you're a sitting duck and someone's got their hand propped up and I knew enough about physics to know that I was going to be dead soon. And I was 26 years old and I had this kind of strange life and it's a strange background and I was going to be dead. And that was a big surprise to me because I thought I had a long life ahead of me. And my first instinct, I had studied death and dying among all these other philosophies and religions and spirituality uh, paths that I had studied. Um, I knew I didn't want to die with anger or upset in my blood or in my soul. I wanted to die in peace. And the first thing I had instinct to do was to go through my past and ask for forgiveness for anyone that I had hurt and to forgive anyone that had hurt me. And that was that was what I did. I, I sort of went back through my past and just forgave, 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 asked forgiveness, asked forgiveness, and just cleaned up the past because I wanted to die clean. And by this time, he shot a third time. And again, the bullet missed me by a fraction of an inch, but the inside of a van explosion was quite loud. And <clears throat> so I, you know, I jumped with the explosion. But then I said, OK, well, you know, I was kind of expanded in time because I could see both in the past and the future. I was expanded in space. And pretty soon I was floating outside the van, looking down at it, uh, seeing this scene going on, which was kind of amusing. Um, but it was this sort of 360 degree vision that was uh, I could see everywhere at once. And I, because I was expanded in time and space, I could see the the path of the next bullet coming into my temple and blowing my brains out. Um, and all that seemed okay. I was talking to God and saying, okay, I'm ready to come home. And this golden light was flowing through me and throwing, flowing through my heart. And it was pure love. And I was just loving everything and ready to go home. Uh, and then he shot a fourth time. And this time my head was thrown violently to the side, blood was rushing down, and uh, suddenly I was back in my body. And I didn't understand that because I was supposed to be out of my body, but I'm back in my body and I'm bleeding and feeling the, the, the pain in my head. 
uh, and I couldn't figure out where the bullet had gone because I was I had studied anatomy and physiology and neurology. I knew that depending on where the bullet had gone, something ought to be missing, but I felt intact. And so I was kind of scanning my body, uh, scanning my senses, scanning my thoughts, and I seemed to be all there. Uh, and at this point, I thought, well, if I'm going to die, I want to at least look my assassin in the eyes. And so I picked up my head and I turned and I looked at him. And he freaked out and jumped up and said, why are you dead, man? You're supposed to be dead. And I didn't have a good answer for that question. I just, I just said, here I am. And he said, why aren't you dead, man? I shot you four times. Why are you dead? It's, it was just like my dream this morning. And I said, what dream? And he said, I, I, was, I dreamed that I was shooting at this guy and he wouldn't die. But it wasn't you. It was somebody else in the dream. And at this point, I said, this is weird. <laughs> this is very strange. Wait, that was the point you said this is weird? <laughs> Sorry. I'm a slow learner. What can I say? I was like... <laughs> Uh, and I thought, well, okay, like this, this is like a movie script. How did I get into this movie? I don't remember signing a contract. <laughs> Am I going to get paid? You know, after, so, so I thought, well, if I can, this is strange. I don't know what's going on, but it's strange. So I was still in this golden love light, uh, and it was flowing out of me and he was included in it. it there was nothing, there was no separation. It was all just a scene happening, uh, in the midst of love. And so I thought if I could talk to him, if I could talk him down, because he was all adrenalated, jumping around, I, I thought maybe he won't shoot me. So I began to speak really slowly to him. And, and, and he kept saying, shut up, just shut up. And he was looking out the windows. We were in the middle of nowhere. Nobody would have heard the, 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 sh the shooting anyway. Um, and at, at one point, he, he said, he kept saying, why aren't you dead? I shot you four times, man. And I said, well, maybe I'm not supposed to die. And he said, yeah, but I shot you. I shot you. And at one point he came up and he sort of was looking at my head and the blood that was everywhere. And he said, does it hurt? And at that moment, I knew that he had switched from wanting to kill me to caring about me. And so I said, yeah, but I, I think I'm OK. And with a few more exchanges, uh, he finally said, OK, man, I'm going to take you to a hospital I know. And I said, OK, I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so he took some stuff and he put it around me so I couldn't move, you know, uh, couldn't just get up and jump him, which I was not in the mood to do anyway. But uh, so he said, and he got in the front of the van and he started driving. And I, I was completely out of time at this point. I didn't know what time it was or what, how much time had gone by. Um, and, uh, and I was still in this golden light space. Uh, and I had some time to think about what had happened. And it was like, it was very confusing. I'd been nice to him. I grew to trust him. Suddenly he pulls out a gun and shoots me. I, you know, what the hell is going on here? Um, and I couldn't come to any conclusions because I just didn't have any additional information. It was just a mystery. He drove for some period of time, I think about a half an hour to an hour. Uh, but again, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. And finally the van pulled over and stopped. And the engine was turned off. And there were no bright lights, so I knew we weren't near a hospital. And there was silence for a couple of minutes. And then he walked back to the van with a gun in his hand. And he sat down to my left. And he said, I can't take you to the hospital, man. I have to kill you. And I said, oh, why is that? I find it's good to be curious when, when confronted with insanity, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and he said, because if, if I take you back to the hospital, they'll put me back in jail. I can't go back to jail, man. And I went, well, back to jail. OK, so now it's kind of not just a crazy person with a gun, a crazy ex-con with a gun, you know, that like elevated the intensity of the situation. And I said, well, you know, um, maybe they won't. They won't put put you back in jail if you take me to the hospital. I said, no, man, I, I I know they'll they'll get, they'll put me back in jail. I can't go back to jail, and that began an eight hour conversation. That where I was trying to we were trying to figure out how to not get him back to jail and how to not kill me.
because that was the goal, right? Uh, at, at one point, uh, and I was asking him about himself, trying to get to understand him as well as, you know, him understand me. Uh, but at one point I said, I, I've been in this crouch position a long time and you know, I'd like to get up and stretch. He said, okay, well, don't, don't do anything funny. I went, no, I'm not going to do anything funny. So he let me out of the van and, and he pointed down a hill to a, to a pond of water. And uh, he was behind me with a gun. And I thought, well, he could shoot me in the back and push me into the water. And that would, you know, that would be kind of logical. Uh, but at the same time, I felt invincible. I felt like I am alive. I am not going to die. This is not my day to die. And so I washed off some of the blood from my hands and my face and my head. And by this time, the bleeding had stopped. I could, you know, I didn't know where, I still didn't know where the bullet had gone. I thought maybe it had gone through my skull, but I couldn't tell. But again, I, I felt completely intact. And I, I stood up from washing myself off and I turned and looked at him. Uh, and he looked at me strangely and he kind of held out the gun and he said, what would you do if I handed you this gun? And I said, I'd throw it into the water there. He said, you wouldn't shoot me? You wouldn't try to kill me? And I said, no, why would I do that? You've got your life. I've got mine. We're okay. And then he looked at me really strangely. He said, man, you are the weirdest person I've ever met. And I knew I was probably the weirdest person he would ever meet <laughs> at that moment. So we walked back to into the van and talked for more hours. The, the sun rose and I heard birds singing. And it was the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard because uh, I was sure I was going to be dead by this time. And we negotiated and I got him to tell me his story. What was, how did he get into this position? And I realized later that, you know, his beliefs and his upbringing brought him to this place of being a criminal. And my beliefs and my upbringing had brought me to this place of being a, a weird salesman on the road. <laughs> and whatever force had brought us together. Oh, one of the things he told me was that he had, he had decided to kill the person who ever stopped to help him he was going to kill. And and so I volunteered, apparently, for this duty. Uh, but then I kept being nice to him, and he didn't understand that because nobody had ever been nice to him before. And so he, he kept bringing out the gun and pointing it at me at different times during these three days we traveled together. But he couldn't do it because I was so nice to him. But he finally decided it was worth it. And that was an interesting moment because when I heard that, I thought, okay, Let's say he killed me, tossed me aside, and he took the van with all of its stuff. I thought, you know, he's got to fence it. And so maybe he's going to get five grand out of the whole deal. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's how much my life is worth. It was good to know, you know, I, someone would trade my life for five grand. And I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Not everybody knows how much their life is worth, but I knew for sure. <laughs> so, uh, over over a period of hours, we tried different negotiations and had more conversation. And finally, we came to an agreement. And the agreement was that he would, I would let him go. He would let me go. I would not turn him in. And he would never do anything like that again. And we shook on it, shook hands, drove to a place that he knew. He got out of the van with his duffel bags and boxes and stuff. And I left him at a bus stop and we shook hands again and he looked at me really strangely and I must have looked strange with blood still dripping all over me. I drove, I went back to the van and drove myself to a hospital where the, the uh, doctor said, you know, you're a lucky man. Two bullets glanced off your skull. And I knew it wasn't luck. I knew that it was blessed. I was a blessed man. And so that began the next phase of my life. So as you're there in hospital, I imagine their protocols, if somebody's sh shot, they call the police, I'm guessing. Whether well, he said, he said you have to not. report this to the police, don't you? You know that, right? And I went, yeah, I know. He said, okay. That's where I left it. Okay. Because I had made a promise. I had made a promise. I, I mean, that's sort of a fascinating... You know, I mean, it, it's it's gripping as as you're telling it. You mentioned at one point early on when you were shot, you realized it's probably going to be my last moments on earth. I need to make peace with, you know, the universe, my creator. And you asked for forgiveness. 
You think somehow as you're asking for forgiveness, maybe that prepared you for the ultimate forgiveness is forgive the person that was trying to kill you. Because clearly in that process, you couldn't have had a calm conversation with somebody unless, at least at a subconscious level, you'd somehow forgiven him as he was trying to kill you. So talk about that dynamic, because that's a fascinating part of the story. I think forgiveness is an important part of the story. Uh, I've told the story many times, of course, including at San Quentin Prison, uh, where I gave talks from time to time. And uh, the prisoners could not understand how that was possible, that I could forgive this person that had assaulted me. They usually said, oh, man, I'd kill that guy. <laughs> I'd say, well, you know, the whole point of the story is forgiveness and you know compassion. Uh, so part of it was my training, my study of Buddhism and different areas of spirituality and all the religions and the virtues. Part of it was my study of science and understanding and philosophy. I mean, I was really a student of life and I knew how precious life was. And uh, and so I, when you when you come from that place of understanding yourself and understanding others in the world, it's a different place to stand than our usual egoic revenge orientation or anger orientation. It's like, I wanted to be at peace. I wanted to die in peace for whatever was next. Let me jump in uh, because we've done, this is like more than 200 episodes now, Lion. I think I talked to you the first time we were about to film the 200th episode. And, and I've not heard many stories that are wilder than Warwick's story. <laughs> And yours qualifies as being wilder in different ways than Warwick's story. And one of the things I do as the co-host of the show is make sure listeners and viewers know that, yes, this story, the details are are perhaps way outside of what you'd ever encounter. And that's true for both Warwick and for you, your crucibles. What are some lessons, though, before we move on into, as we always do, to how you bounce back, what are some, I mean, what are a couple of takeaways people can take from their own crucibles, be it losing a job, um, going through a divorce, um, you know, fighting with family? What are some of the lessons that that experience taught you that you can impart to the folks who are listening and watching? First, I think there's a lot of lessons you could you could get from this. Um, one is what you said at the very beginning, which is uh, this didn't happen to you, it happened for you, right? That this the attitude of um, this is a gift, no matter what it is. Sometimes it's a pretty ugly looking gift. You know, sometimes it's a stinking gift, uh, but there's something to gain from it, no matter what. There's some way of looking at it, a perspective of looking at it as a gift. It's really hard to see it from the inside. Usually you, could, you catch up with that later, but the more you can see it uh, while it's happening as you know, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm interested. I'm curious. I want to understand it and I want it to make me a better person. That particular orientation, I think, is really what your whole show is about. But it is the lesson that's there. It's like these things happen. Sh shit happens. Pardon my language. Uh, it's just part of life. Pain happens. It's part of life. Suffering happens. It's part of life. And how can we use it? as a uh, grist for the mill, as something to digest, understand, uh, get through to the other side and use it as a lesson for becoming a better person. Uh, you know, we can't really know fully. We can guess as to why things happen. But as you look back, assuming you think there's a purpose to this, um, why do you think that happened? What was, I don't know, I want to say gift, but what was almost the gift in this experience that you needed to experience? Interestingly, most people who have near-death experiences uh, go from being very, having a very grounded life, like grounded in physical reality, to having a spiritual life. So, like something opens for them spiritually. I was already open spiritually. Uh, what I needed was grounding. <laughs> so I actually got more grounded uh, from this experience. Uh, and I, after it happened, and after I recovered for about a month, I went looking for a job, and I got a job as a headhunter, which is kind of ironic, really, when you think about it. I mean, <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> but that yes. that was a career that I had for 25 years, uh, working with corporations and people, uh, applying everything I had learned uh, to the people business. And so it, it grounded me. Um, uh, other people that might 
have a different purpose. Uh, for me, it also helped me sort of really get at a at an experiential level that we are beings having human experience. We're not humans having a spiritual experience, you know. So we are spiritual beings. When I was outside my body, I recognized, oh, I have a body. I'm not my body. I have emotions. I'm not my emotions. I have thoughts. I'm not my thoughts. I'm something far more magnificent than any of the things I have. And I believe that to be true for everyone. I believe that we are amazing, incredible, complex beings having these human experiences for a purpose. <clears throat> Some people say it's for soul evolution, for learning lessons over many lifetimes. Other people have different explanations. I agree that it's a mystery. We don't know for sure, but it's fun to speculate. So, I mean, you're a student of all these, uh, you know, religion, psychology, consciousness, it sounded like, did it ground all that and make it less theoretical and um, more real? That, that there was sort of a, a focus, uh, like a light being diffused and then becoming a laser beam, that somehow it, it focused all your learning uh, in a way that it wasn't as focused before, perhaps? Well, it certainly focused me as a person. Uh, I wasn't a wandering salesman anymore. <laughs> I, was, uh, <laughs> I was serious about life. <laughs> so it definitely focused my life and it brought, it brought me to a place where I had to get, uh, I had to understand not just spiritual reality, but economic reality. You know, I needed a job. I needed money. I, I didn't want to be a traveling salesman anymore. That was for sure. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so it, it gave me a sense of, all right, there's this whole other part of life that other people spent most of their lives on, the economic realities of, of uh, you know, survival in the culture, right? So I got very enculturated, balancing out all of that spiritual, you know, high level religious and philosophical ideas that I had. So, but then I combined them. I found that, okay, I can combine living in the world as a person, as a, as a man with the spiritual technologies. And I continue to, to research and understand uh, who we are as people. I took more than a hundred workshops and trainings while I was a headhunter by day and a, a shamanic practitioner at night. <laughs> so I was doing shamanic studies and, and uh, studying with, with great teachers from all over the world. Uh, and so I continued to be a learner until I finally knew enough that I could be a teacher. So how did you shift from being a headhunter and executive recruiter into what you do now? What, how did that shift come about? Well, that was my next crucible. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we don't just have one crucible in life, as you know. We have, uh, no. we have a series of them. Um, so... Uh, I, had, I had started my own headhunting business. Uh, it was successful. I had a million dollar search firm and employees and, you know, paid rent in a beautiful office building and <laughs> doing doing that thing. And I was quite good at what I did. Uh, and then the dot bomb happened uh, and around 2000. And that was the beginning that my industry that I specialized in, which was healthcare informatics, just went just tumbled down. All these people became available uh, because of companies going out of business, and they and the other companies that survived didn't need headhunters anymore. So my business went from being a million dollar business one year to a zero business in two years. <laughs> it was just a straight line down. And uh, at that, and I so I I was I was kind to my employees. I said, look, I'll keep paying you until you find other jobs, but I'm out of business. Um, and so uh, I went into debt to pay them because they had been loyal employees. Uh, and so then I was left with a bunch of debt and no business and no income. And I was kind of floating around, uh, not knowing what the hell to do. And my girlfriend at the time uh, was a teacher of coaches and was a coach. And she said, why don't you be a coach? And I said, I don't know anything about coaching. 
And she said, yeah, of course you do. You've been coaching executives <laughs> and people looking for jobs for 25 years and you've done all this inner work. You can, you can, co I don't want to coach anymore. I'm going to give you my clients. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so again, uh, circumstances led me to start coaching people. And it turns out that I loved it and I was really good at it. And that began my second career as a coach. And then I realized that these, the technology I was using was, which was so effective with people other people could use it. And then I began teaching it as well. It's interesting. You started out the conversation by saying um, you had a degree that you created in consciousness studies and nobody was hiring that year or that decade or whatever it was, right? They weren't hiring that, that thing. But um, what would you attribute to what would you attribute your being able to move beyond that shooting crucible for sure? Because you have not right? You haven't tried to find this guy since then. You haven't tried to track him down. You haven't tried to get even. You haven't, you've let it go, which is, can be very hard for people to do. And I think that's a microcosm of how you've let go of all the emotions that were in there. So is it a, is it a sandwich almost? Those two pieces of bread, what you studied and what you went through, those things are both necessary for what you're doing now, helping people learn to let their crucibles go. Is that a fair assessment? It is. I hadn't thought about it that way, uh, especially the sandwich analogy. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, there's many different kinds of sandwiches. Um, and so uh, for me, it when I look backwards, it makes sense. Uh, you know, looking forward, I couldn't make it make sense at all. I was just doing what was right in front of me. And so if you keep doing what, what's in front of you and you, you keep an open mind, I think you will be led to what's next. Absolutely. I, I want to transition to what you do now, because I think it's really, uh, there's a connection there. I know you've written a number of books, one of which is clear, your limiting beliefs. And I can certainly relate to a lot of you know, what I read on your website about um, <clears throat> clearing. You put the, the crappy programming, which I thought was a very you know, good word, actually. You know, words matter. Um, and that's a good word. Um, and it's easy to uh, take on other people's beliefs, expectations. And you talk about finding, you know, your virtuous true self. And so just talk about how, how it's so important to clear those limiting beliefs to actually find your own. Because that this is a huge, huge concept that you spend your life in. So uh, we all have beliefs, hundreds or tens of thousands of beliefs. And some of them are really messing with our lives. Uh, others are useful, like the belief, look both ways before you cross the street. That's a good belief to have, not just for kids, but for adults, because otherwise you get hit by a bus, right? So we have to sort through and find the programs that aren't useful anymore and clear those out of the way so that we can be a free human being. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying, Line, is so profound. I mean, um, there are some beliefs that we have uh, that are not serving us. They're programmed into us by, you know, some people have abusive parents, or maybe they went through, <clears throat> you know, a terrible crucible that, you know, um, warped their way of, uh, of thinking. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's important to throw off those beliefs that are limiting and that don't serve us, and at least from our perspective, are not quote unquote true. What is truth? One philosophers have been debating that for thousands of years. But from our individual perspective, I think we all have a sense of what's right, what's wrong, what's true, and what's not true. Yeah, well, that that is the point of, about beliefs, is that beliefs are either useful or not useful. They're not right or wrong, good or bad, true or false. Uh, and a lot of people mistake beliefs for being one of those categories. Uh, beliefs are the tools we use to have experiences. And if we have negative beliefs, we're going to have negative experiences. And if we have positive and empowering beliefs, we're going to have positive and empowering experiences. One of the problems with beliefs is that they are always self-verifying. So if you believe life is hard, you're looking through the lens called life is hard. And what mm. you see is all the hard parts of life. If you were able to change that lens out and see life is joy, then what you would see was life Life is joy. So people will get stuck in their beliefs because they're seeing the truth of them, the truth meaning 
the reality. They're seeing that reality. <clears throat> and that's because they're looking through that particular lens, not because that's what the world is. It turns out that all beliefs are limiting. When we look at a cat and we say, oh, that is a cat. We call that a true statement because that's our agreed upon name for that animal. But if you got to know that animal intimately, you would see that it's an extraordinary being with an extraordinary perception of the world doing extraordinary things. And it's, it's a, a unique being. But as soon as we label it cat, it's now an object. And now we've got an abstraction on the object and we don't have to pay attention to it anymore. If we pay attention to the world and we experience it as it is, it's extraordinary. It's miraculous. Uh, but we, but beliefs tend to make our world smaller and smaller and smaller because the brain wants to understand the world and know how it works. So it concludes certain things about the world because that's most efficient for the brain. So it's a, it's an interesting mix. The crucible experience is one where you have to examine all of those beliefs you've held and the lenses you've seen through for so long, suddenly it's all turned upside down and now you get a fresh look and now you can actually see what is useful, what's not useful. And do I want to let those old beliefs go? Because they're certainly not serving me. They might have even caused the crucible to begin with. This is a good time for me to jump in as the co-host and because you've offered some very robust points for folks to be able to gather up as they work through their own crucible experiences. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, ask you on behalf of our listeners and viewers, uh, Lion, to tell them how they can learn more about you, more about your services. How can they find all about you on the World Wide Web? Great. Well, my website for clearing beliefs is called clearyourbeliefs.com. And people can get my free ebook called Clear Your Beliefs um, on that site and find out about our programs. And for people interested in the things I have to say and my thoughts and writings, uh, they can go to liongoodman.com and uh, that links to all the other websites. I suffer from multiple website disorder. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that will that will lead people to all the other things I do, including my training called the Clear Beliefs Coach Training. So I thought I have as we kind of um, begin to conclude here is uh, – I know for us at Beyond the Crucible, um, yes, we want to kind of unpack the, we'll throw off the beliefs that are not serving us. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways we talk about of getting Beyond the Crucible, uh, yes, is to learn the lessons of them, to understand what are your beliefs, passions, desires. But as you think of vision and moving forward, because, you know, one could dwell in self-analysis forever, which is useful to a degree, but at least from my perspective, is not as the goal in life, it doesn't is not very fulfilling. So at least from my perspective, most joy and fulfillment, irrespective of religion or philosophy, I think there's general agreement, comes from being other centered, finding some higher purpose. I don't think you'll find a psychologist that I know of, and you know more than I do, that will say, yes, it's true to be all focused on greed and money and pulverizing people, and you can really be happy as I don't know that a psychologist would actually say that's actually true. There is, for my some things are true, and it's true that that doesn't work. So I guess from your perspective, as people are looking to get out of crucibles, that they're becoming more aware of themselves, they're throwing off the baggage of beliefs that aren't serving, um, you know, uh, it sounds like you're on the same page that how do they move forward to finding a vision that actually does give them joy and fulfillment because it somehow serves others? Does that kind of make sense? Is that Have you found a similar story that joy and fulfillment comes from somehow serving others in some fashion? Yeah, absolutely. I, I help people find their purpose by connecting them with the, their higher self, with their higher knowledge and wisdom. And I've never seen someone's purpose be all about me. <laughs> I've never seen anyone's purpose be about making more money. Uh, I've never seen anyone's purpose about, you know, I'm going to get the most toys before I die. So the purpose always has to do with others, with serving others. And there's many ways to do that. You could serve one other person or a whole community or a whole civilization. Um, the, the, the soul, which I, I believe that our purpose is of the soul and that the soul has a purpose and it has an intention for our life. 
And it's always about giving your gifts. It's not about accumulating from others. So I agree with you completely. That is how we make it work. Um, I t teach a lot about the virtues and going back to Aristotle, you know, the virtues are, are the qualities that make us happy. He called it, uh, uh, um, uh, eudaimonia. Sorry, it took me a moment to get that word. So in the Greek word eudaimonia, it means human flourishing. And so he said, when you act in ways that make yourself happy and others happy and the community happy, then you're acting virtuously. And so it's not just about me. It's always about more than me. And that philosophy, that looking at the world and saying, how can I make the world a little bit better? How can I contribute to to making someone else happy, that's true purpose and it's true happiness. Right. Well, you're acting virtuously in that, you know, Aristotelian um, way. And I like that word. Um, Therein does lie joy and fulfillment. And I feel like in something in my life, um, there's some additional level of healing when you feel like you've used using your crucible and your challenges to help others it begins to help you find purpose and finding Absolutely. purpose and in meaning. something. Yeah. That, and meaning, exactly. There's some, it doesn't mean that you, there won't be a scar. I've certainly had my scars from my upbringing and the whole, you know, the family business ending on my watch. But yet, as I'm using my story to help others, there's some level of healing and some level of, of meaning. And also it gives you a greater degree of empathy, right? Who am I to judge others when I've made some cataclysmic mistakes and Absolutely. So, you know, your crucibles and challenges, they can serve you and can serve others. That brings joy and some level of, you know, some level of healing. I talk about drops of grace, if you will. Does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. It's uh, great. We need grace. Grace comes from above. We can't count on it <laughs> in terms of uh, expecting it, <laughs> but we can certainly welcome it when it comes. Uh, and, but we do have agency. We do have the ability to decide and do. And you know, there's a myth that if you think positively, it will all be okay. But that's not true either. It, it takes action. We have to bring our beliefs into action and take action on our beliefs in order to make a better world, in order to actually change the world and make it better. Um, so uh, hopefully the world will grow up one day and we won't need to change its diaper every you know, every year. But, <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> but uh, but so, at some point, you know, we, we have to become adults of God, not children of God. Well said, well said. So just as we close here, um, one of the things I often think about is there might be somebody today who maybe today's their worst day. Maybe they're in the bottom of the pit. Hopefully they won't be in the level of crucible that you're at. But, you know, crucibles take different forms. And they might not really feel that there's any purpose or hope in life. What would you say to somebody who feels like, I have no purpose, I have no hope, and I really don't like myself anyway? You know, I'm messed up and nobody likes me. I don't like me. What is some, I mean, how do you get out of that pit to, you know, live a life more of hope? Um, you know, how do you get out of that mindset, would you say? A lot of people need a little bit of psychoeducation. They need to understand their mind. They need to understand how the brain works. And when, and so a person like that, I would say, well, first of all, do you want to get out of where you are? Because if you don't want to get out of it, I can't help you. <laughs> but if you have even a glimmer of wanting to get out of that place, I can help you. But first you have to understand how your mind works and why you're thinking like you think, why you're experiencing what you experience. And so I'm going to take five minutes and explain it, and then we can decide what to do next. Because if you're lost in the midst of the, the mental jungle uh, and you don't have a direction and it looks hopeless, give me a glimmer of hope. Well, the glimmer of hope is that you can change it. You, and it takes some action. It takes some work. It's not it's not instant and it's not easy, but you can make steady progress step by step. I often call my, my methodology the machete principle, which is that if you're in a jungle and you have a destination, there's all kinds of stuff in the way. But if you have a machete, at least you can cut what's right in front of you and take a step forward. And then you can cut the next thing in front of you and take another step forward. 
And with just a machete, you can get all the way through the jungle to your destination. So that's what I, I teach. And uh, I'm proud of the work I do because we're freeing people and awakening them to their potential and giving them a new vision of what's possible and then giving them the tools to make it happen. Because it's great to give someone a vision, but they also need the tools and the understanding of how the world works and how you create in the world. Uh, and so giving them all the tools they need and the vision, now we've got a good formula. Well, I have been in the communications business long enough, folks, to know when the last word has been, <clears throat> I usually say spoken, but I'm going to say has been roared on a subject and Lion <laughs> Goodman has just roared it. Um, so until the next time we are together, friends, uh, please remember that we understand, as we've talked about here, um, your crucible experiences are painful. My goodness, Lions was painful, like physically, emotionally, mentally. Warwick's is painful, it was painful. Mine's been painful. We get it. We know that they're painful. But we also know this, that if you apply the lessons of that crucible, of your crucibles, if you recognize that they did not happen to you, if you can get yourself to that place, they didn't happen to you, but they happened for you. That jumping off point can lead to the greatest chapter of your life, because where that chapter will lead you to, where that story will end, is a life of significance. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.